So my name is Rémi Ambul. Welcome to everyone uh, online and in person. Uh, so it's just a word for me as a director of the Center of Medieval and Renaissance Culture to say that this year's CMRC wrote a lecture, uh, which is co-organized with the Parks Institute, uh, uh, concludes a very rich and uh, very uh, insightful, successful day on identity, culture, and language in the pre-modern world. Uh, and uh, I seize the opportunity to thank again everyone who participated in, in it. But without further ado, uh, I want, I'm, I'm delighted to give the floor to Professor Mark Sperling, Vice President, Research and Enterprise, who will introduce the lecture and our guest speaker. Thank you very much, Mark. Many thanks, uh, Remy. And uh, may I also share my welcome uh, to those in person in the room with me and us and to those uh, larger number who are joining this lecture online. Welcome to the University of Southampton. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce this year's Reuter Lecture. Uh, this annual lecture honors the memory of Timothy Reuter, Professor Timothy Reuter. Tim was the most distinguished German-British scholar who held a chair of medieval history here at the University of Southampton between 1994 and his untimely death in 2002, when he was at the pinnacle of his career. He has been deemed as the most influential and creative medieval historian of his generation. High praise indeed. This year's Reuter lecture concludes a study day, as you've heard from Remy, uh, on the theme of cross-cultural interactions and exchanges, which is a very fitting theme indeed to give homage to Tim's rich heritage and tremendous scholarship, which raised a great opportunity for the Centre of Medieval and Renaissance Culture to link with the Parks Institute. Tim's German heritage and family history bring him close to James Parks. Tim's father was a non-Jewish refugee from Nazism. His father, Tim's grandfather, was the socialist mayor of Berlin and thus at extreme risk when the Nazis came to power. Tim's father was looked after by Margareta Burkill, who ran the Cambridge Refugee Committee, one of the largest in the UK in the 1930s. Tim thus had a close link to the refugees of that time whom James Parks helped bring to England and looked after. One does not need to have met Timothy, and indeed I haven't, but to appreciate the extraordinary scholar he, he was, whose extensive research and publications in early medieval power politics and religion has been and continued to be a source of inspiration to historians. Timothy Reuter was also a versatile scholar who edited a wide range of German medieval texts he also pioneered the use of computer technology for text editing himself and also database archiving at the Monumenta Germaniae Historica, the great medieval research institute in Munich, where he had worked for the 12 years before he came to Southampton. The field of medieval studies owes much to Timothy Reuter, and not just because of his excellent research or his state-of-the-art knowledge in computer science, but because Timothy also worked hard on fostering dialogue and connections between the worlds of Anglo-American and German medieval studies, most notably through a substantial work in translation. Cross-cultural interaction is also at the heart of the eminent scholarship of our speaker this evening, Irvin and Professor Irvin M. Resnick, who is the Professor and Chair of Excellence in Philosophy and Religion at the University of Tennessee. His research focuses both on medieval Jewish-Christian relations <laughs> and on the 13th century philosopher, theologian, and natural scientist, Albertus Magnus. Professor Resnick is the author of about 60 scholarly articles and the author, translator, or editor of 18 volumes, including Marks of Distinction, Christian Perceptions of Jews in the High Middle Ages, published in 2012, and Albertus Magnus and the World of Nature, to be published later this year. He has been a contributing member to the Center of the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters, at Ben Gurion University. He is an associate of the subfaculty of Near and Middle Eastern Studies at Oxford University's Oriental Institute and a senior associate of the Oxford Centre for Hebrew and Jewish Studies and a distinguished visiting fellow at Queen Mary University of London. This evening, Irvin will deliver a lecture on a wet nurse controversy, Jews, Christians and later medieval racism. Professor Resnick, we look forward to your Reuter lecture. Thank you very much. Now let's see if we can load our slides. Okay. Uh, 
Zoom is telling me you can see the slides and you can also see my floating head, I believe. Yes. And I see Andreas is shaking his head. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, if, even if only on a sort of virtual platform. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but uh, uh, Zoom will have to serve. All right, well, let's begin. On uh, July 15th, 1205, Pope Innocent III <clears throat> dispatched his letter, Etse Deus, to the Archbishop of Sens and the Bishop of Paris, in which he remarks that although the Jews, whom even the Saracens cannot tolerate, are graciously permitted to dwell alongside Christians, they are consigned to a state of perpetual servitude owing to their guilt for the crucifixion. Even though they've been received by Christians with mercy, the Jews treat their hosts with contempt, quote, like the mouse in a pocket, like the snake around one's loins, like the fire in one's bosom. Worse still, Innocent adds, he's heard that Jews insult the Christian faith. Thus, whenever it happens that on the day of the Lord's resurrection, namely Easter, the Christian women who are nurses for the children of Jews take in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the Jews make these women pour their milk into the latrine for three days before they again give suck to the children. Such behavior is so reprehensible that just six months earlier, Innocent had ordered the King of France, Philip Augustus, and other secular rulers to restrain the excesses of the Jews and to forbid them to have any nurses or other kinds of Christian servants in the future, lest the children of a free woman should be servants to the children of a slave. Innocent exhorts the French ecclesiastics to warn the king and to punish the insolence of the Jews, adding, if indeed the Jews do not dismiss the Christian nurses and servants, we give you our authority to forbid any Christian in the district under penalty of excommunication to enter into any commercial relations with them. In some ways, Innocent's emphasis upon the perpetual servitude of the Jews is unremarkable and merely expands upon the Pauline view expressed in Galatians 4 to warn that Christians who are the children of the free woman, Sarah, disrupt the divinely ordained order when they serve the Jews, who are the children of the slave woman, Hagar. Therefore, Christians must not dwell among Jews as domestic servants, nor even as wet nurses to their infant children. Furthermore, in Etsy non Dispicia Domino, a letter from January of 1205, Innocent had already chastised the King of France for failing to punish transgressors of the canons of the Third Lateran Council, under which Jews are not permitted to have Christian servants in their homes, either under pretext of rearing their children, nor for domestic service, nor for any other reasons whatever, but that those who presume to live with them shall be excommunicate. Yet they, the Jews, do not hesitate to have Christian servants and nurses, with whom at times they work such abominations as are more fitting that you should punish than proper that we should specify. This prohibition presented hardships for Jewish families where a Jewish wet nurse was unavailable and Jewish communities sometimes sought exemption from this prohibition. This prohibition against Christian wet nurses seems to have been widely ignored, providing another instance in which economics, wet nurses could at times be well paid, evidently prevailed over ecclesiastical concerns. King Henry III's repeated prohibitions against Christian wet nurses in English Jewish households demonstrates just how difficult it was to eliminate this commercial tie. It's clear then that Jews employed Christian wet nurses as well as other Christian domestic servants and that for a long time, the church had attempted to prevent this. Ecclesiastical condemnations did not succeed against social and economic interests. But in Etsy Deus, 
Innocent III, who had complained loudly that Jews across France are unscrupulous usurers, thieves, blasphemers, and secret murderers of Christians, adds the unsubstantiated rumor that on the day of the Lord's resurrection, after they've received the Eucharist, the Jews make these women pour their milk into the latrine for three days before they again give suck to the children. And this letter has generated a good bit of scholarly debate. The employment of wet nurses instead of maternal nursing had long encountered ecclesiastical disapproval. Although as Thomas of Chobham remarked in the early 13th century, mother's milk is best. Nonetheless, medical authorities generally insisted contrary to modern views, that for several weeks after childbirth, the mother's first milk, colostrum, is toxic and unhealthful. And this conclusion stems from the medical commonplace that breast milk is produced from the conversion of menstrual blood, which had nourished the fetus in utero. As Albertus Magnus explained in his massive commentary on Aristotle's On Animals, Following childbirth, the menstrual blood, which used to be drawn to the substance of the fetus, flows back to the breasts. Now, once the fetus has been formed and completed, the first milk, namely that which is near the time of the fetus's birth, begins to be generated. It does no good whatsoever. It's still as bloodied as it was, fit for nothing at all, except to be poured out as a purge of the superfluities which are in the womb, veins, and breasts. How long is this period of unwholesome first milk? Soranus's second century gynecology, which was paraphrased in Latin by the early sixth century, recommends a wet nurse for the first 20 days after birth, since for 20 days, the maternal milk is in most cases unwholesome, being thick to caseous, and therefore hard to digest. Other authorities indicated 30 days or more. And just as the first milk proves to be unhealthful, so too Albertus Magnus claims that maternal breast milk that's produced a long time after childbirth is too thin. Employment of a wet nurse ensures that the infant will be properly nourished and not endangered by the mother's corrupt first milk or by the nutritional deficiencies of her later milk. Even those medieval medical authorities, for example, Avicenna and Helle Abbas, who preferred maternal breastfeeding to preserve consistency in the nourishment from fetus to newborn, recognize that very often the mother's postpartum condition prevents her from nursing her infant and a wet nurse will be necessary. In addition, Lactational amenorrhea, that is the cessation of menstruation, a new mother may experience during breastfeeding, at least during the first six months, which medieval natural philosophers understood to result from the conversion of menses to breast milk, reduced the period of the mother's fertility. On the one hand, lactational amenorrhea could provide the parents a period of natural contraception which might discourage the use of wet nurses. But since the church understood procreation to be the principal purpose of marital relations, it instructed nursing mothers to abstain from intercourse. On the other hand, lactational amenorrhea and a prolonged period of female infertility might not be in the interest of husbands, especially those who are desperate to produce a male heir. As a result, prosperous or aristocratic husbands and occasionally their wives contracted with wet nurses to leave the wife free to become pregnant again sooner, to increase the number of live births and to ensure an heir. Medieval Jewish views of maternal breastfeeding and wet nurses were informed by many of the same texts, the same medical texts that Christians read. Like their Christian neighbors, Jews also employed wet nurses. And very often as necessity dictated, they employed Christian wet nurses. As Eliseva Baumgarten has demonstrated, 
the employment of Christian wet nurses was common practice in medieval Jewish Europe. The Christian should nurse the infant in the Jew's household rather than in her own to ensure proper supervision, although this requirement was considerably relaxed in, 12th in 13th century France and England. Typically, the child was nursed for a period of 24 months. Nonetheless, medieval Jewish sources acknowledge risks attached to the employment of a Christian woman. The late 12th to early 13th century Sefer Hasidim or Book of the Pious warns that the Christian wet nurse might introduce unclean, that is unkosher foods to the Jewish household, or might sing lullabies with Christian religious content to the infants. The Christian wet nurse might also lead the Jewish mother to stray from her religious traditions. Jewish parents might also fear that a disgruntled Christian wet nurse, unhappy with the terms of her employment, might harm the infant in her care. Christian texts introduce other concerns for the Jewish parents. Peter the Chanter had inquired whether a Christian wet nurse may secretly baptize a Jewish child. And Vincent of Beauvais remarks that Christian wet nurses may baptize the Jewish child if the child is in danger of death. John of Freiburg's Summa Confessorum asks whether it's per permitted for wet nurses when they bathe Jewish children to baptize uh, these children secretly. And John also concludes that it's permitted if the child's life is at risk. Jewish fears that Christian wet nurses or domestics might secretly baptize their children were not unfounded. For the early modern period, Catherine Aaron Beller has identified several instances in which Christian wet nurses took Jewish infants into their homes and baptized them. Even as late as the 19th century, Pope Pius IX ordered the forced removal from his home of a six-year-old Jewish boy at Gardo Mortara after the Christian housekeeper secretly baptized him during an illness. Despite these dangers, Jews were driven by necessity to employ Christian wet nurses when Jewish women were unavailable. As I noted, the Third Lateran Council of 1179 prohibited both Jews and Saracens, that is Muslims, from having Christian servants in their homes, whether for nursing their children or for any other reason, since such domestic proximity might lead simple Christian women to adopt the religious errors of the Jews. Innocent III threatened Christian domestic servants who ignored this prohibition with excommunication. The First Synod of Tarragon, 1239, even refuses Christian burial to wet nurses who nurse Jewish newborns. Although a close reading of the Third Lateran's Canon 26 could suggest that Jews and Muslims might employ Christian nurses outside their households, medieval rabbinic opinion typically demanded that the wet nurse work in the Jew's home or under close supervision in her own home if she lived very nearby. Nonetheless, in the Hebrew account of the Paris Disputation of 1240, Rabbi Yehiel of Paris claimed, as evidence of good relations between Jews and Christians, not only that Jews and Christians routinely engage in commercial exchanges, but also that, quote, we entrust our infants to their households for nursing. Domestic economy and church canons were poised for conflict, however, and later, many later ecclesiastical authorities insisted without great success, that Jews should not employ Christian servants anywhere, whether in their household or outside its walls, lest Christians be subordinate to Jews or be led into their religious error. Therefore, the 13th century Dominican Raymond of Penafort also threatened excommunication to those Christians who have commerce with Jews until the Jews have dismissed their Christian wet nurses and servants. And still as late as 1434, the Council of Basel was compelled to reiterate the decree that, quote, neither Jews nor 
or other infidels should have either Christian men or Christian women as domestics, whether as servants or as wet nurses for their children. Innocent III's complaint introduced a new theological antagonism, however, with the rumor that when Christian wet nurses receive their Eucharist, the Jews make these women pour their milk into the latrine for three days before they again give suck to the children. And Innocent added this to his complaint that Jews are thieves and secret murderers of Christians. Under his initiative, moreover, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 will demand that Jews wear a special garment or a badge to distinguish them from their Christian neighbors to avoid illicit sexual encounters. Innocent's allegations exacerbated relations between Jews and Christians. The 16th century text, Shevet Yehuda, Judah's Rod, judged him harshly when it recalled his death in 1216. Quote, in that year, the Pope, namely Innocent III, who had spoken evil about our people, suddenly died. Innocent's rumor entailed more than simply a criticism that Christian women served in Jewish households. He accused Jews of insolently forcing their Christian wet nurses to express or pour out their milk after receiving the Eucharist as further evidence of the Jews' hatred for Jesus, whose real body and blood, Christian theologians maintained with increasing determination, is substantially present in the Eucharist. His allegations seemingly implied the unlikely conclusion that Jews conceded that Jesus's body and blood are really present in the Eucharist, leading confirmation to a Christian doctrine of transubstantiation. That Jews wrongly infer that once Jesus's blood is consumed by the wet nurses, it's converted, like menstrual blood, to breast milk. And therefore that the wet nurse must be compelled to pour this milk into the latrine, either as an insult to Christ or perhaps to prevent his now converted blood from contaminating the Jewish infant. The mid 13th century Summa Aurea of the Italian canonist Cardinal Hostiensis confirms this interpretation, remarking that there are some Jews who have Christian wet nurses who, it is wicked to say, do not allow them to nurse the children because they have consumed the body of Christ until they have first poured out their milk for three days into a latrine, as if they, the Jews, understand that the body of, of Christ is received in bodily form and descends into the latrine, but that is false. Previously, the 11th century Cardinal Humbert of Silva Candida had complained of certain Christian heretics, identified as stercorianista, uh, that is, relating to excrement, who believe in error that the heavenly food of the Eucharistic host is removed as excrement after it's been, been digested, just like earthly food. Now the, this Christian heresy has been imputed to the Jews. This is confirmed too by Bernard of Parma's gloss to Gregory the Ninth's Decretals, which glosses the term effundere, to pour out, by citing the interpretation of the early 13th century canonist Laurentius Hispanus, who remarked that the Jews, quote, perhaps believed that Christ's body goes down into the stomach and is given bodily form, which is false because it is food for the soul. The Christian assumption that Jews understood the Eucharistic elements to descend to the stomach as ordinary food to be evacuated during defecation was not entirely unjustified. The Nitzahon Vetus or Old Book of Polemic, a late 13th century anthology of Jewish anti-Christian polemic, inquires with reference to the bread and wine that Jesus gave to his disciples at the Last Supper. In what sense was it his body that they ate and drank? Moreover, where did that body which they ate and drank descend? 
Did it go its way separately? Or was it mixed up in the stomach with all the other food? Christian theologians and canonists also wondered whether the Eucharist, Eucharistic body and blood of Christ passed to the stomach. Albertus Magnus explains that although the body and blood of Christ pass into the stomach under the spachiase, the appearance of the bread and wine, nonetheless, it's not digested there like other foods that are formed into blood and then distributed to the body's members. It's not then blood to be converted to breast milk, nor should one expect that it will be evacuated with other foods. If Jews insisted that Christian wet nurses pour out their milk into the latrine, perhaps this was meant to emphasize that God is not present in the Eucharistic elements, that after they are consumed, they're merely ordinary food to be digested and eliminated. And that processes of, of digestion and elimination in no way befit the divine majesty. Medieval Jewish sources provide no evidence, however, that Jews demanded that Christian wet nurses pour out their milk. If Jews did require the wet nurse to express her milk, there may be another more innocent explanation. Since before receiving the Eucharist, the Christian woman would be expected to observe a strict fast. And Avicenna's popular canon of medicine, which had been translated by Jared of Cremona, had warned that the milk of a fasting wet nurse is sharp and unsuitable for infants. But rabbinic rulings exempted Jewish women who were nursing from ritual fasting requirements. Could the behavior attributed to Jews have a more benign medical basis then, namely to ensure that the infant received the best milk? Despite the absence of evidence, that Jews required the Christian wet nurse to pour out her milk, some modern historians have accepted this underlying premise, that Jews inferred that if their children consumed the milk of Christian wet nurses after the nurses had received the Eucharist, the nurslings would be tainted by impurity. Israel Jacob Yuval suggests that the next generation of Jews after Innocent III's death, responded to Innocent's accusation by internalizing it and establishing the very practice he had condemned. While David Beale considers that the prevailing medical belief that breast milk was converted from blood inclined Jews to conclude that the milk of wet nurses who had taken the Eucharist was contaminated with the body and blood of Christ. Beale even adds that the three days that the text alleges the Jews poured the milk into the latrine must have come from Christian knowledge of the Talmudic law on not contracting business with idolaters three days before or after their festivals. A Latin translation of almost 2000 Talmud passages that appeared in Paris about 1245 the Extractiones de Talmud, or excerpts from the Talmud, does include a discussion of the Talmud's Avodah Zarah 2a, which prohibits Jews from receiving anything from Goyim for three days before, and some teachers add for three days after their festivals. This Talmudic requirement is also mentioned in the Hebrew account of the 1240 Paris Disputation although Rabbi Yehiel then immediately points out that contemporary Jewish practice takes no notice of this prohibition. But neither this text nor the Extractiones de Talmud connects this prohibition to the practice condemned by Innocent III in Etsy Judeos. Nor do I see evidence that four decades earlier, Innocent III was even aware of this Talmudic prohibition. Rather than a reference to Avodah Zarah 2a, Hans Jörg Gilman's thesis seems far more plausible. That the three days during which innocent believed Jews compel Christian wet nurses to pour out their milk is a reference to the second of the three day periods 
coming before and after Easter. That is from Monday Thursday till Easter Sunday, from Easter Sunday to Easter Wednesday. Although earlier canonists demanded that lay people receive the Eucharist at Easter, Pentecost, and Christmas, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 will decree that every Christian receive the Eucharist at least once a year at Easter. Connecting this alleged Jewish practice then to Easter links it to a time of heightened religious tensions and anti-Jewish polemic, which often included charges of ritual murder coinciding with the time of the Passion. <clears throat> Jeremy Cohn has pointed to an additional practical difficulty, however, stemming from this alleged practice among Jews, that their infants would be entirely deprived of nourishment for the three days and thereby placed in danger of death. And Cohn has provided an alternative to Gretzel's nearly canonical translation of the passage in Etzeudeus to suggest that Jews required their Christian wet nurses to express merely a few drops of their milk for three days, rather than discard their milk entirely, in order to avoid the implication that Jewish parents wouldn't feed their children, their infants, for three days. For Cohn, this indicates neither that the Jews let their infants go hungry by abstaining from the wet nurse's milk for three days out of fear of being parties to idolatry, nor that the Jews were believed to buy into Eucharistic theology. Instead, expressing a few drops of milk has symbolic significance that Cohn links to a tradition of anti-Christian excremental polemic in which Jews refer to Christian churches as latrines, identify the most holy figures in the Christian narrative, Jesus and his mother Mary with excrement, and locate them in a latrine, both literally and figuratively. Matthew Paris, for example, reports that about 1250, a wealthy English Jew, Abraham of Berkhamsted, purchased a carved statue of the Virgin, quote, nursing her son at her bosom, like icons of the Madonna Lactans, and cast it into his latrine in order to dishonor Christ the more every time he relieved himself. More than this, as I suggested above, requiring the Christian nurse to express a few drops of her milk would comport with Jewish anti-Christian polemics that repudiate the notion that God can be contained in a material body at all. What better way to express this than by consigning the body and blood of the Christian God to a latrine? The practical difficulty Cohn mentions that entirely pouring out the milk over three days would have caused the Jewish infant to starve may have another solution. Ancient medical texts mention the possibility of using animal milk to nourish human infants. Soranus, already mentioned, remarks that if a wet nurse is unavailable, then for the first three days the newborn should be fed honey or a mixture of honey and goat's milk. Lacking a process of pasteurization, the use of animal milk introduced additional risk, but it remained an option nonetheless. In sum then, it's clear that 13th century ecclesiastical authorities sought to remove Christian wet nurses from Jewish households because the Christian wet nurses were in theory, subject to sexual predation from Jewish employers because of the accusation that Jews scandalously forced Christian wet nurses to pour out or express their milk after receiving the Eucharist, and because their presence in a Jew's household undermined the church's understanding of the proper hierarchical relationship between Christians and Jews, masters and servants, a relationship incidentally that rabbinic tradition understood rather differently. For example, the Nitzahon Vetus or Old Book of Polemic remarks that they, namely the Christians, bark that it's improper for the uncircumcised and impure to serve Jews. On the contrary, if not for the fact that they serve Jews, they would have been condemned to destruction. For it's written in Isaiah, arise, shine, for your light has come. For the nation and kingdom 
that will not serve you shall perish. And Christians were aware of Jewish eschatological interpretations of Isaiah 49, 23. Kings shall tend your children. Their queens shall serve you as nurses. Rabbinic tradition understood this as fulfillment of biblical prophecy in which Jews are awarded ultimately the dominant position over non-Jews, inverting the Christian hierarchical understanding of the subordinate status of Jews, but enabling Jews to view perhaps their Christian witnesses as part of their own effort to restore a proper order to the world. But what of Jewish women serving as wet nurses in Christian households? This would seem not to violate a Christian understanding of proper order, but would place Jews in a subordinate position. Consequently, in the late 13th century Latin Passau Anonymous, the text acknowledges that Christians can employ a Jewish woman as a servant, although warns that she shouldn't live in the Christian home. At the same time, however, the notion of the subordinate status of Jews serving Christian households may collapse into incoherence, since as Kenneth Stowe has remarked, ecclesiastical authorities prohibited Jewish or Muslim physicians from attending Christian patients because, quote, this would make the Jews and Muslims the superiors of Christians, even though Jewish medical practitioners served Christians. It seems that merely by conceding authority to their medical judgment, Christian patients inverted the proper order of things. Did Jewish women serve as wet nurses then to Christian children? Elisheva Baumgarten has been un unable to find a single case of a Jewish woman who nursed Christian children. And generally rabbinic rulings prohibited Jewish women from nursing a Christian infant. The Extractionis de Talmud includes Talmudic texts that forbid a Jewish woman to nurse the child of a Christian under most circumstances, because she would be aiding the upbringing of one who will engage in idolatry. Rabbinic prohibitions notwithstanding, Christian sources, both secular and ecclesiastical, express concerns over Jewish women who nurse Christian infants. In 13th and 14th century Iberia, for example, a preoccupation with purity of blood resulted in repeated injunctions against Christians using Jewish wet nurses, just as they were enjoined from using Jewish midwives or Jewish physicians. Nonetheless, Christians often turn to Jewish midwives and physicians, and it's not unreasonable to assume that they also employed Jewish wet nurses. Moreover, we do have at least one documented case from the later 15th century brought in Aragon against a new Christian woman who employed a Jewish wet nurse. Furthermore, a letter of 14 July 1459 from Pope Pius II to the Bishop of Nice complained that Christian women nurse Jewish infants and that Jewish women nurse Christian infants. The Pope's letter adds the surprising complaint that the Christian children, owing to continuous contact with Jewish counterparts, even learn the Hebrew language. That Christian children learn Hebrew from Jewish women and children seems unlikely, since Jews would more plausibly converse with their Christian neighbors using a romance vernacular. But in addition, the Pope adds that when the Jews see the Eucharist being carried across the city to the sick, they proclaim that it's a thing deserving of contempt and they spit on it. And the threat of such quotidian encounters leads Pius II to order the Jews to dwell in a designated quarter separated from Christians, to wear a badge to distinguish them from Christians and to prohibit Jews and Christians from gathering on the same market days. Does the Pope's complaint that Jewish women nurse Christian children merely reiterate long-standing secular and ecclesiastical prohibitions, or could it reflect a real relationship? It's difficult to know with certainty, but similar injunctions against Muslim women nursing Christian infants do reflect 13th century reality. That is the use of Muslim slave women to nurse Christian infants. And Rebecca Lynn Weiner has shown that archival records for 13th century Perpignan and surrounding areas 
demonstrate that wealthy and aristocratic urban Christian women frequently employed Muslim wet nurses. The reality and threat of cross-confessional nursing as a source of pollution may also be responsible for the introduction of new racialized language to discourage the practice. Racially charged language surrounding the wet nurse controversy depends in part on a longstanding medical tradition that bad wet nurses will transmit their vices, both physical and moral, to their, their nurslings through their milk. And although this assertion tended to privilege maternal breastfeeding, since the mother's milk is the most natural for nourishing the infant, when the mother is unable or unwilling to nurse, medical authors generally recommended a wet nurse whose humoral complexion is nearest that of the mother, since the infant acquires the character of the one whose milk nourishes it. According to a late 13th century text on complexion attributed to the Dominican John of Newhouse, in general, other considerations remaining equal, parents will produce a child sharing their complexion underscoring the increasing importance assigned to the hereditary transmission of both physical and moral traits. This may have negative consequences. If parents have a melancholy or other bad complexion, their infant nourished by the mother's milk will share her complexion and develop the same vices and physical attributes. If the mother is leprous, for example, or when the infant is nourished by the corrupt milk of a leprous nurse, then, quote, this contagion passes into the progeny as if by a law of heredity, according to Bartholomew the Englishman. In the same, Scott, same way, Michael Scott had observed that the infant naturally will reflect the moral and physical characteristics of the one from whom he received breast milk. One who's nursed by a wet nurse with an abscess will develop an abscess. Children nourished for a long time on sow's milk or goat's milk will display their characteristics. The former will be inclined to play in the mud and will eat like a pig, whereas the latter will jump about and chew on plants. And we should recall this transmission of the sow's attributes view it via its milk when viewing medieval images of the Uden sow. Although animal milk or the milk of the wet nurse can transmit negative characteristic, John of Newhouse affirms that if instead is an infant is nursed by a beautiful, well-complexioned nurse over a long period of time, the child's complexion will be favorably altered. The wet nurse's milk may actually improve a child's character if the nurse's complexion is superior to that of the biological mother. And these considerations led later medieval authors to caution parents that since the infant's development and character is subject to influence from the milk received from its nurse, one must, one must select a nurse with great care. Avicenna provide, provided fundamental advice. The ideal wet nurse will be 25 to 35 years old. Her skin complexion should be midway between red and white. She must be in good health and of good moral character cheerful disposition, and emotionally stable, so as not to undermine the infant's development. Her diet must be carefully monitored. Her physical characteristics are important, since one who has a monstrous body develops a monstrous soul and monstrous conduct. According to Bernardino of Siena, the child acquires certain of the customs of the one who suckles him, if the one who cares for him has evil customs or is of base condition, he'll receive the impress of those customs because of having sucked her polluted blood. The emphasis upon the transmission of physical and moral attributes via the milk will also inform prohibitions against cross-confessional nursing. <clears throat> Christians will increasingly infer that a Jewish wet nurse's impure blood will convey to the child via the breast's milk deficiencies associated with a Jewish complexion and character. In much the same way that cross-species nursing will transmit bestial characteristics to the nursling. 
13th century Christian physicians and natural philosophers had adopted the notion of a specific, inferior, and melancholy Jewish complexion, as I've argued in my Marks of Distinction. The notion that the wet nurse's milk transmits a character the, to the newborn could also explain the troubling persistence of Jewish or Muslim customs and practices among converts. Iberian Christians in particular express concerns that converted Jewish women, conversas, would transmit a Jewish character to Christian infants and contaminate them, causing them to Judaize, or in the case of Morisca wet nurses, to Islamicize. Such fears expanded following the mass conversion of Spanish Jews in the late 14th, 15th, and 15th centuries. The 15th century Spanish physician, Jaime Roig, who insisted that baptism fails to alter the underlying character of Jewish and Muslim converts, warned that a Jewish wet nurse will transmit Jewish defects to the Christian infant. And certainly after the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain in 1492, the focus shifts to conversa and morisca nurses who based on their lineage will be prevented from obtaining a certificate of cleanliness of blood. The Franciscan Juan de Pineda urged authorities to take preventive measures. No morisca women or women with Jewish blood should breastfeed the child of old Christians because even the blood retains the beliefs of their ancestors. The children, without any fault of their own, might receive some vice for which men will later judge them harshly. The Spanish historian Prudencio de Sandoval in his biography of Emperor Charles V insists that a Christian with even one Jewish ancestor has an impure bloodline. And according to Sandoval, who cannot deny that in the descendants of, their, of the Jews, there persists and endures the evil inclination from their ancient ingratitude and lack of understanding. This is just like with the Negroes who cannot free themselves from their black color. Even if the latter father children of the, with white women a thousand times, these children are born with the dark color of their fathers. Thus it's not sufficient for a Jew to be three parts descended from the nobility or old Christians since even being only part of the raza or race of the Jews infects and corrupts him so that all his deeds are those of Jews and extremely damaging for the community. To avoid passing on their impurity, one must also avoid conversa wet nurses and a fear of conversa and morisca wet nurses will travel to the new world with Spanish colonization. Conclusions. By the 13th century, as we've seen, attention had turned to the trans transmission of moral and physical qualities with the milk given to the nursling, whether it's the mother's milk or the milk of a wet nurse. These qualities are inherent in the complexion and blood, and it's the blood that's converted into breast milk. For this reason, later medieval authors identify the appropriate moral and physical qualities one should seek in a nurse. Previously, church councils had prohibited Jews from employing Christian wet nurses because living in the Jews' household placed them at risk of religious errors and because working for the Jew inverted the proper hierarchy that should define Christian-Jewish relations. Innocent III added a new consideration in Esiudeus that the Jews scandalously forced Christian wet nurses to pour out or express their milk after reception of the Eucharist which is the body and blood of Christ in contempt of Christianity. By the 14th and 15th centuries, however, Christian texts increasingly focus on the biological inheritance received from breast milk and turn from concern over Christian wet nurses in Jewish households to Jewish wet nurses for Christian children. Biology leads them to, ur to urge Christians to avoid Jewish and conversa wet nurses in order to safeguard the infant from the corruption or stain of Jewish traits and characteristics, both moral and physical. And this shift will contribute to an increasingly racialized discourse against Jews. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Resnick, for this uh, fascinating lecture, uh, which has uh, given us a deep insight uh, into the medieval wet nurse uh, controversy, its uh, theological, social, biological argument, and, and as well into the debate over the cross-cultural interactions and even racism uh, that it informs. So uh, we now take questions from the audience in presence, in person and uh, online. Ivan, can you stop sharing your... Yes, let me see if Thank I can you. remove that. Uh, okay. No, we don't want that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Mm -hmm, not that. Okay. It's just going to take me a minute to figure out how. Uh, so I can do that. It's done. Brilliant. Oh, it's done. Okay, yeah. good. Good. Oh, no, I'm not story. Wait. So it's Mark Spearing here. I'm not a, prof a historian, I'm an engineer. But I was just really interested. Um, I, I mean, I'm interested how someone comes to study something like this uh, and what got your attention. But that got me to thinking. So what preceded this, that Pope Innocent 1205, if I got the date right, made this pro proclamation, but presumably this wasn't a new thing. And wet nursing goes back to prehistoric times out of need. Mothers died in childbirth, all sorts of reasons why you'd have a, net, a wet nurse. So it feels to me like there's a, a, a backstory through that, that led up to this, that Pope Innocent sort of dived into and made his proclamation. So, so what's, the, what's the backstory for wet nursing and interracial, intercultural, interreligious uh, mm -hmm. attitudes towards it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's a good question. And of course, uh, you're right, there is a backstory. Uh, uh, part of the issue, uh, again, as I, as I indicated, part of the issue is that the uh, uh, the church had certain reservations about wet nursing, uh, uh, certainly going back to uh, Pope Gregory I, possibly even before that. The church wanted to, uh, to persuade mothers uh, to nurse their own infants uh, as often as possible uh, and sought to discourage wet nursing when it could. But it, it certainly faced the... the uh, it faced the, the, the difficulty that in many cases, women are simply, simply unable to nurse their own children. Uh, they may have medical conditions, uh, perhaps they die in childbirth and a wet nurse becomes absolutely essential. But under those circumstances, then uh, over a period of time, the question becomes, uh, can individuals from other religious communities employ wet nurses within their households? Can Jews employ Christians? Can Christians employ Jews? Can Christians employ Muslims as wet nurses? And uh, I think that becomes a serious concern, um, especially uh, in the, uh, as, as I you know, indicated in the, in the late 12th and 13th centuries, when we see more and more ecclesiastical prohibitions uh, issued against uh, the Christian employment of Jews in their households, a greater fear that Jews are somehow going to contribute to, uh, to, to somehow subvert or undermine uh, the religious integrity of the Christian community <laughs> simply by having Christian servants working for them in their households. And also undermining a kind of ideological position that Jews should always be subordinate. They should always be based on this allegorical understanding of Galatians, they should always serve Christians and not the other way around. Uh, and so this leads then the, the papacy, I think, to, uh, to initiate uh, uh, stronger and stronger prohibitions, uh, excommunication, uh, uh, to try to, to, uh, to force these communities to sever these commercial ties or these, these, these links uh, and uh, to protect the Christian community. But Innocent, I think, is doing something quite unprecedented uh, uh, with his suggestion that Jews 
are, are forcing these Christian wet nurses to pour out their milk as a way of demonstrating contempt for Christianity. That, that is quite new. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much for that uh, paper. I, I appreciated it. Um, you've been talking about the uh, policing of Jewish wet nurses primarily in terms of anti-Semitism. Uh, sorry, I should look into the camera. That's better. Uh, uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, of, course, of course, that makes sense. It's really important. Um, but there's a gendered dimension to this as well. Um, Clearly, if uh, you know Jewish wet nurses are for being, being forbidden from working, then that's going to have a gendered impact on their participation in the labour force. Uh, in Europe at the moment, we see a, a particular particular focus on policing the wearing of the hijab as um, a Muslim custom, and again, the outcomes of that are very strongly gendered. So, I wonder if you'd like to comment on whether there are kind of equivalent anti-Semitic uh, ideas that are targeted at male Jewish people, or if, um, or if there is just a tight intersection here between uh, misogyny and anti-Semitism. Thanks. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. That, uh, uh, your question took a, a, a turn I wasn't anticipating, uh, but it's a very interesting question. Let me start by suggesting as a basic premise that anti-Jewish sentiment expressed in later medieval Christian Europe, and by that I mean, say, 13th through 15th centuries, uh, was typically directed against Jewish men uh, who, were seen to, who were seen to be more of a threat. Uh, Jewish women, I mean, we have uh, a number of studies that have looked at uh, the kind of paradox, a kind of paradox paradoxical appeal that Jewish women presented to Christian men, uh, the, the, the sort of attractive figure of the, the exotic Jewess, okay, uh, uh, who might actually uh, attract Christian men and uh, might even be uh, regarded favorably or positively in some Christian texts. Jewish men, on the other hand, were far more, typically far more threatening. Uh, but there is, yes, I think a, a gendered element, um, and uh, uh, not only are Jewish women then the target of later medieval Christian texts that um, uh, attempt to to attribute to the 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 uh, attribute the transmission of Jewish defects moral and physical defects via breast milk. Obviously, Jewish women there are the target. Uh, but we also see in Christian, later medieval Christian culture, uh, efforts to, uh, I would say, to, to um, uh, feminize Jewish men, uh, attributing them to them, for example, uh, the, the, the notion that Jewish men are subject to a peculiar kind of male menstruation, that they also, uh, uh, they also uh, um, bleed in a way that is parallel to uh, the, the menstrual cycle of females uh, and that their bleeding in some way, I think feminizes them, genders them for later uh, medieval Christian Europe. Now there's no suggestion that, they, that Jewish men could breastfeed uh, with the exception of a couple of uh, well, one uh, sort of uh, 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 miracle tale in uh, rabbinic texts, but uh, uh, the the idea that that Jewish women were particularly threatening uh, when they were serving Christians at wet, as wet nurses, and that they become the vehicles for a transmission of these Jewish defects, uh, I think that uh, uh, that does begin to make Jewish women. Uh, a more threatening image uh, as we uh, approach the, the 14th and 15th centuries. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's what occurs to me uh, at the moment. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, thank you.
much. Uh, I, I lack confidence <coughs> in the microphone, which is why I'm looking at it conservatively. Um, so um, I really enjoyed that. I found it really interesting. Um, and I think my question actually follows on from your response to the last one. Or um, So from following your timeline, you talk about conversus and moriscos, and the, I guess the greater number of those people in Iberia um, seems to coincide with a change in thinking and this and this rising concern about um, Jewish um, women potentially passing on defects through the blood um, to um, to Christian infants. Um, and um, I found that really, uh, really intriguing because it sort of isn't and this may be a really stupid and obvious thing today, but is not that basically suggesting that conversion isn't actually possible? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what it's saying. Uh, that uh, uh, conversion um, does not alter the, uh, I don't know if I want to say the essential character of the convert, uh, but certainly that conversion uh, does not have the kind of uh, change, does not produce the kind of change that one would expect. Uh, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, in fact, even in the title, I put racial here in quotes. Uh, I'm a little reluctant to, su to suggest that this notion that conversion is uh, ineffective, that this is a, a kind of racism, because I have my own peculiar views about what race and racism means in this context. But certainly, I think that there was um, uh, a consensus among uh, Christian thinkers, uh, especially Iberian Christian thinkers, say in the late 15th century, that um, uh, conversion might ultimately lead or produce a faithful Christian, but that it would take many generations. It's not something that could be, uh, there, it's not a transformation that could occur immediately. It doesn't occur simply uh, by the reception of the waters of baptism. It is a long-term process and it will take many generations. It, typically the number four comes up. And uh, uh, so what that suggests is that the, the, the conversa or the moresca, the, the, uh, the, the Muslim uh, woman uh, who converts to Christianity, they're still carrying with them the sort of burden of uh, uh, a a quasi-racial identity. Uh, and that burden will remain with them for several generations. Ultimately, uh, that, that uh, quasi-racial identity may be transformed into a Christian identity, uh, but it doesn't happen uh, in a single generation. And typically it's going to take uh, three to four generations. So we have a question from Helen, uh, who uh, first uh, said that analogy it was a fascinating talk. Uh, could you say more about the nature of uh, Nizaron Vetus, Vetus as a source? Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. How far mm. does it present literary tropes or evidence of contemporary historical <laughs> circumstances? Mm. <laughs> Okay, can I say more, Helen? I wish I could say a lot more about it. Uh, I mean, what I can say is that, uh, uh, what I can say is no more than what David Berger says in his introduction uh, to his critical edition and translation, namely that Nitzahon Veta seems to be a collection of anti-Jewish uh, polemical uh, themes uh, and texts uh, that, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Ashkenaz, okay, so from uh, from Central Europe, from Germany, France, and so on, that these texts probably emerge from the late 12th century until uh, you know the, the late 13th century, at which point they're collected in a kind of anthology, which presumably uh, would be used within Jewish communities to somehow bolster. Uh, uh, confidence of Jews when confronted with Christian claims, they could turn to a collection like this uh, and find within it uh, a kind of Jewish response. 
uh, you know, how was it used in this wet nurse controversy? Uh, I'm not suggesting that, that uh, Jews responded to innocent's accusation uh, in any direct way. Uh, what I was trying to imply or suggest was that Nitzha und Vetus gives us a text uh, with respect to that, that, that tells us something about how Jews may have understood the process uh, taking place in the Eucharist, the process that Christians understood to result in transubstantiation, uh, the real presence and so on, and Jews asking the question or su suggesting, I think, isn't it more likely that this is just ordinary food, just bread and wine that ultimately is going to pass through the digestive system and be excreted like other waste products. Uh, and uh, so if that's the case, uh, uh, I think that leads to uh, uh, the, the possible conclusion that if Jews required Christian wet nurses to pour out their milk, which we can't establish. I mean, this is innocence. Uh, uh, this is innocence claim, uh, but it's not a claim that's corroborated by any kind of um, uh, uh, any kind of direct evidence. Uh, but if Jews did that, innocent seems to think, or Christians seem to think, that somehow this supports the contention, right? That in the uh, Eucharist you have transubstantiation. What better way to, to, uh, to corroborate or confirm a dogma of transubstantiation than to point to the Jews and say, well, look, even our enemies understand that the body and blood of Christ are present in these elements. Why else would they require the Christian women to pour out their milk? What I'm suggesting is, well, it could just be the opposite, that they, they believe that, that these elements are not converted into the body and blood. They're just ordinary food uh, and uh, uh, that as ordinary food, they're going to be uh, excreted like other waste products. Uh, but again, it's not, it's, there's not a direct link. Uh, uh, I'm just su suggesting that, okay, these are texts that were gathered about the same time that Innocent is making his accusation and perhaps they reflect uh, some Jewish um, uh, 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 the way that some Jews understood what was going on in the um, uh, in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much for a riveting lecture. I'm a student midwife, particularly interested in, in breastfeeding. I'm so sorry. Okay, in breastfeeding and a Jewish Christian, I found the fear of secret baptism very interesting and I believe this fear continues today. Do you think this fear continues today, to this day? Uh, uh, fear of secret baptisms. Um, do I think it continues today? I don't, I really, <laughs> I'm stumped. I don't really know. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I think it was a legitimate fear in the Middle Ages, um, particularly for midwives, uh, Christian midwives, by the 14th century, I mean, we have we understand that Christian midwives were uh, typically required a kind of ecclesiastical license. Uh, the license only the, the license essentially gave gave them training in performing the sacrament of baptism, uh, so that when a midwife encountered a a fetus a, 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 or an infant. Uh, whose life was at risk because uh, during the, the, the birth, uh, the midwife had to be trained in performing baptism so that the soul of the infant would, uh, would not be consigned to limbo, uh, so that the soul of the infant would benefit from Christian baptism. And so midwives were, uh, were uh, at a sort of critical point, right? Uh, 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 the, given the, the rate of infant mortality, one can imagine that midwives very often uh, had to perform baptism uh, on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the fetus or the infant. And so 
Christian midwives had to uh, obtain a, a, a license from the church, which simply indicated, I think, that, that they had received that training uh, and uh, uh, they could perform that role. So I think that, that it was a legitimate fear uh, that uh, uh, Christian wet nurses as well uh, and sometimes I think the distinction, the barrier between wet nurse and midwife or the distinction between the two is not entirely clear. Uh, I think it was a legitimate fear that, that Jews might have had that uh, uh, Christian wet nurses could perform a secret baptism. And you know, we have a number of texts that at least um, conclude that such a baptism would be valid, uh, which is of course another issue. Where it, baptism is the only sacrament that women would be permitted to perform. And uh, there's an extensive literature in the 13th century among scholastic theologians trying to, uh, to, to establish uh, the, uh, to, to argue that women uh, uh, can perform the sacrament of baptism, that laymen, uh, that laywomen can perform the sacrament of baptism. So uh, I think it was a legitimate fear. Uh, does that fear continue to the present day? Uh, I really don't know. I mean, I think that it might continue into the early modern period, uh, certainly into the 19th century, as in the case of uh, uh, Edgaro Motara. Uh, uh, but I don't know whether it, whether it persists after that. Uh, it's a good question. Um, can I ask a, a question, uh, Griffin? Um, I wondered, I mean, I, it's quite fascinating to see that there is uh, such a, a, a controversy and uh, so, so many uh, theologians, thinkers arguing about this uh, uh, wet nurse issue. I wonder to what extent do we know the actual extent from other sources of the employment of Christian wet nurses by Jewish family and vice versa, or whether this controversy, we know, we, we believe that there is a, a large extent of exchanges because of the controversy. And should we trust that? Is this controversy, does, the, does it reflect uh, or, or they are making arguments? It's a, a good argument to make and to dispute between uh, uh, Christian and Jewish. Right, yeah. I think there's I think there's ample evidence uh, of uh, Christian wet nurses in Jewish households, um, uh, particularly yeah. There, there's ample evidence of Christian wet nurses in Jewish households. Uh, I think Elisheva Baumgarten has compiled a lot of that data, and you know you, you uh, we could find in her work uh, mm, some kind of numbers. Okay, uh, we could quantify it in some way. Okay, I don't have at my fingertips. Uh, I'm not able to, to, to cite the data to tell you what percentage of wet nurses in Jewish households were Christian women, but we know they're there and we know the church is concerned about it. Uh, the more difficult, the more difficult to quantify would be Jewish wet nurses in Christian households. And that's why I said, you know, we have only a couple of cases we can point to. Uh, from the later Middle Ages, uh, one from a case that went to the Inquisition, and it involved a Christian woman who employed a Jewish wet nurse, but she was a new Christian, so she was a recent convert. And in that context, it, I suppose it makes some sense, right? I mean, if you're a recent convert, but still your social context may still be with your old community, uh, and it still may be reasonable then to turn to a Jewish woman as a wet nurse for your infant, uh, or perhaps her conversion came uh, uh, after uh, after parturition, after birth. Uh, you know, we, we don't know all the details, but um, I think uh, when we begin, you know, if we begin to look more closely at some of these conversion, uh, some of the the, the the material, the literature on conversion, we might find there actually more evidence of Jewish wet nurses serving Christian women, particularly recent converts to Christianity. And that also, uh, that also uh, perhaps promotes uh, the fear that these Jewish, that these Jewish traits, these Jew, this Jewish heritage, this, this Jew, Jewish character uh, 
persists because uh, these Jewish wet nurses are still serving uh, in these Christian households. Um, so I don't know how we can quantify Jewish wet nurses in Christian households, but I believe they're there. Uh, I believe we have at least a few examples. So we have uh, somebody who wants to raise a question, Vadim, Vadim Putu. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, perfectly well. Yes. All right. Yeah. Greetings from Israel. So um, a quick question. I was fascinated um, by your lecture and uh, a lot of what I'm, I'm thinking in terms of symbolic anthropology and a mm. lot of what you've been saying <laughs> in terms of the connection and the, the, the sort of the, the, the symbolic substitution between blood and milk resonates specifically in the 13th century with the concerns about um, symbolic exchange between blood and wine, particularly with the, with the question of Eucharist. Hmm. So, so I'm wondering to what extent that is uh, thematized, especially in Christian sources. I'm familiar with Kabbalistic sources, I'm familiar with the Zohar and how to some extent it uh, appropriates and responds to Christian concerns. Um, but um, yeah, and, and, and sometimes when you, when you get to the dichotomy between milk and blood, then, uh, sorry, with milk and wine, then, then, then milk goes, so to speak, one direction and, and wine goes the opposite direction, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I mean, the, the milk, uh, uh, Milk and blood, you're right. I mean, the, the, the symbolism quite clear, milk obviously nourishing, blood also is nourishing, nourishing the, the, the body parts and so on and being distributed through the body. Uh, mother's milk is nourishing. Uh, uh, and also this sense that the milk is itself a product of blood, uh, right. that it's converted from blood. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's fundamental uh, in the, the, the medical tradition uh, from the ancient world, but also in Arabic and Jewish and Christian sources. I mean, I think they're all sharing the same, uh, uh, the, the same medical principles uh, that looked upon uh, uh, the mother's uh, menses as the nourishing material for the, eat, for the fetus. And then after birth, it becomes breast milk. Uh, so then the question you asked was about the parallel between the blood and the milk and the blood and the wine. Right. How does wine fi figure into that picture, in your opinion? Particularly Eucharistic wine. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, okay, so clearly in the, in the unique instance of, the, uh, of transubstantiation, of the conversion of the body and blood of Jesus into bread and wine. Uh, there we have an instance in which the blood becomes wine, uh, although scholastic theologians wouldn't like me to say become, uh, just is the wine, right? Uh, but uh, it becomes the wine. And uh, 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 it, it also has nourishing properties, but Christian theologians will insist that the nourishing properties are not that it doesn't provide nutriment for the body, it's, uh, its nourishment is to the mind, uh, to the soul, okay? So it nourishes the soul or the mind, and in that sense, it's heavenly food and not food for the body, right? Not ordinary food. So there, there, is, a, um, there is a discussion that will take place about, okay, in what sense now does the bread and wine, and uh, you know, wine being at least part of it, uh, we can't really separate the two because they're always going to be together in this, but uh, in what sense uh, do the, the properties of uh, the bread and wine, in what sense do these, now that they that, that substance has been transformed, what is it that they're nourishing? Uh, and, and they're pointing you know, very clearly at, at the sort of mental uh, capacity, uh, the ability to create faith, uh, to create a transformation in the intellect, a transformation of the soul rather than a transformation in the body. I think that's probably the best I could do with that. No, that's great. That's very interesting because it's, uh, 
about kind of the altered states of consciousness and 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 and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. Okay. Do you, do you have any particular source in mind that I could look well, into? Uh, I'll tell you what. If if you can off offline, <laughs> if you want to email me, I'll try to put together a few things. But uh, um, I think it it does become uh, it does become an issue. It does become a theme in uh, a good bit of uh, scholastic discussion from the 13th century about transubstantiation. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> what nutrimental function does it serve, and that this nutrimental function is somehow uh, should be applied to the mind, to the soul, rather than to the body. Uh, yeah, if you can email me, I'll try and put together a few things. Thank you very much. Sure. I'll ask you a question from the audience. Um, well, whatever topic comes up these days, I tend to talk about everything being indebted to ancient Egypt. But um, <laughs> it seems particularly appropriate. I was thinking, um, well, I mainly, I'm, I'm interested in the iconography of the Madonna Lactans um, these days being obviously derived, given that it doesn't have much biblical justification <coughs> in the, the, the importance of the virgin breastfeeding, the, child, the God child, Jesus, doesn't really have much um, presence in the Bible, but it's something that's evolved, obviously, I think from Isis the goddess Isis breastfeeding the god child Horus. But there is an enormous, as a result of being interested in that, there's an enormous amount of literature in ancient Egypt about wet nurses. And there's a lot of iconography of pharaohs being breastfed by goddesses um, who are fighting <coughs> wet nurses. But there is specific information about wet nursing in Egypt. And I would have thought that was the long, the deeper origin of, of what we're talking about today, because a lot of, um, mumbo jumbo there as well but actually more mumbo jumbo thanks to innocent the tenth in the innocent the third and the mm -hmm. lateran council i was also I, coincidentally i went to a lecture last night by um anna abolafia which is in a way answers the question on my left about the um about the male equivalent anti-semitism about money lending mm -hmm. um, ironically given in honor of licoritia who is a female jewish money lender right and the other thing that occurs to me is the um irony of Moses being abandoned and being then breastfed by what Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's mm -hmm. conned into thinking was a wet, a wet nurse, but was in fact his mother. Right. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about the story of Moses too, as you were bringing up Egypt. Uh, and uh, 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 clearly this story would be transmitted also to Christian readers. Uh, I'm not yeah, I mean, so as you're saying, in, in ancient Egypt, also obviously Greek texts, uh, you know, dealing with wet nurses, uh, Soranus has mentioned here, uh, but there were also other texts that were transmitting uh, medical doctrines about wet nursing to, uh, to Latin medieval Europe. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm, if you're asking, uh, is there any direct, were, were Latin Christians aware of Egyptian sources? Uh, not to my knowledge, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, uh, that there weren't that there was uh, uh, none whatsoever. But not to my knowledge. Well, what the, well there is an article, of, uh, a long article about um, Egyptian wet nursing, um, but I'm not sure what you're querying. But um, but in general, I think through Alexandria, as ever, this this stuff is is transmitted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Irene, and thank you for this beautiful uh, lecture and for answering uh, the questions. And uh, I, I'd like uh, everyone to join me for a last round of applause for your beautiful performance here. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the end, and uh, unfortunately, we can't invite you for the drink, uh, uh, Irvin, but we, we will raise a toast uh, uh, on your behalf. Uh, yes, have a drink on me. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Bye -bye. So, the wine and wine reception, uh, which is awaiting for us. <laughs>